Hey guys, Hunter Cowcast here. And I had seen a midnight screening or Ghostbusters 2016. And I have to say that out of all the bitching and moaning and whining and complaining and well, what's the final verdict? Sorry, I have a little bit of bed hair here or you know, morning hair. I have thick hair, so nothing I can do about it. Hair that I still have. Uh, anyway, what did I think of the movie? It was... Adequate Verge, which is adequate and average. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be something like Anchorman 2 or something like the interview or something like any of the recent Apatow movies where it's just four people getting together and just doing a lot of dick and fart jokes. And I was bracing myself to see like Slimer doing a lot of fart jokes and nothing like that happened. I did like the fact that at the end as I was leaving the theater though I got a Cinemark Ghostbusters flashlight that looks like I guess like a trap from Ghostbusters or something like that. It's green. But they didn't serve EctoCore. I did purchase one last case, but off of Amazon Prime. I'm not going to get any more. It, it's, as I said in my other vlog, it's a food hack and it's not terrible, but it's not what I remembered it was. Which is not, you know, again, just me, but you get the idea. Um, so, what do I think of the movie otherwise? I'm going to be fair right now on the podcast. I'm going to be doing a small comparison of the 84 version, why I enjoy that a lot more compared to the 16, but. I'm going to give bits and pieces right now. Semi spoilers or if you don't want to hear you know full thoughts on sixteen, I suggest you stop the video. Five four three two Okay, you've been warned. Two thousand sixteen. Uh what were the cons? Unfortunately it's a reboot, and reboot means you start all over again. You know, Sony seems to be known for that, especially with Spider-Man. But problems I have with this is that they try to reenact the library instead of the library now. It's a mansion in New York City that belonged to a duke, I think. And his daughter went insane, so he kept her in the basement until she died. And apparently a ghost haunts the mansion... But a tour guide is just like putting these props, pretending the place is haunted, but then it really is haunted. And how he ends up getting away from the ghost is pretty much, it's not explained. You know, you think he would get possessed or something by the ghost, but I don't know, it is what it is. Um, the introduction to the Ghostbusters in this movie, unfortunately, are not as interesting. There's little to no chemistry with them even though McCarthy and Wig are supposed to be childhood friends and they had a falling out and Wig is a professor at Columbia University in the physics department and Melissa McCarthy apparently is a science teacher at this I guess midtown school high school that teaches science you know it's one of these specialty schools but it's in a bad area and she has a science lab, but she's not the Bill Murray character. I don't think any of them are supposed to be the previous characters because there's no passing the torch because in this world the Ghostbusters never existed. So even though, with the exception of Howard Ramis, they all make cameos some way, in shape, or form. Um, I will say this much though: there is no chemistry between these women. But the breaking at the best performance is actually Leslie Jones. I saw the trailer with her, and I was groaning with all her screaming and shouting and sass and everything. I have to admit, Leslie Jones is possibly the best thing of Ghostbusters 2016. She she really is the breakout star for this movie. She is awesome. There's not enough of her. She's an MTA worker, and apparently because of her being an MTA worker, she knows a lot about New York, and she proves it. She says it. She says that the subway station she worked at used to be a prison, 
and then it was made into a subway station, and they do go to a hotel, not the hotel from 84, but they go to a hotel and she's able to discuss some of the history about it. I understand that she's not going to be the Zed Moore character, but she is the every person that seems to know a lot. She is actually, if you get past her scenes in the trailer, again, she happens to be the best thing. Um, Kate McKinnon, I've watched her a lot of Saturday Night Live. I love her when she impersonates Hillary Clinton. There's a sketch where she plays a mermaid that's a blobfish. Even when she's not the star of a sketch, she's fun to watch. Here, she's like a Ace Ventura type of character that just... She, she dresses like Ace Ventura at one point. Uh, th there's a scene where they meet the ghost, you know, in the trailer where Wig introduces herself to the ghost and the ghost just vomits slime over Kristen Wig. Well, there's a scene where they do come face to face with the ghost. McCartney is takes out the camera. Wig is trying to walk up and interview it. And Kate McKinnon just happens to have a thing of Pringles and eats it. And that's something like Ace Ventura would do. And like Ace Ventura, crazy but also smart at times. And I guess McKinnon's supposed to be this Bengal character because she's creating all the proton packs and the traps and whatnot. But... She's... I mean, there's even a moment where she's dancing to a song and she's holding two flamethrowers and they're close to the equipment and McCarthy's saying like, you know, you're lighting that equipment on fire, you're lighting that equipment on fire. And what is McKinnon doing? She's just walking around dancing with these torches and I'm, or these flamethrowers and dancing to it and not caring that it, it's going to set off and destroy the equipment. I'm like, that's something that Ventura would do. So I'm not... I'm not too sure why she decided to go Ace, all Ace Ventura. I know that McKinnon said in interviews that playing this character is what she's like in real life or something that effect, but no matter what, it still feels like something like Ace Ventura would do when I see Kate McKinnon's character on the screen, no matter what. And if you wanted to go do an Ace Ventura movie, that's great, but I just, a lot of people were disappointed with this character, and... I wanted to see more of Kate McKinnon, but this just, she wasn't jiving for me. And McCarthy, as much as I like Mike and Molly, and I've seen Spy, and he, um, I don't like Tammy, and I didn't really like the boss. And here, she doesn't do much. I mean, again, she and Wig are supposed to be childhood friends, because... In high school, Wig's character saw a ghost, and McCarthy's the only one who believed her, and they became good friends, and Wig wrote a book about ghosts, but then ended up becoming a professor at Columbia, and didn't want to talk about the book anymore, and McCarthy apparently found a way to put this book on Amazon, and... They're just like these falling out, but they never really. You never have that classic argument where they separate for a while and. It just. They talk about it for a few minutes and that's it. I mean, there's really. There's no real falling out or real argument or anything. It's just really bizarre. Uh, the story is. Here's the thing, though. People say that women can't be Ghostbusters, but Janine in the Saturday Morning Cartoon series was a Ghostbuster now, and then she kicked ass. I know in the comics, I didn't read most of the comics, there were real Ghostbuster comics during the cartoon series. There was an IDW series, I didn't read too much. There was the Extreme Ghostbusters, where a woman was a Ghostbuster. Women can be anything they want to be. There are women firefighters, contractors, plumbers. I mean, grow the fuck up, people. If women want to be Ghostbusters, that wasn't my problem with it. My problem was, is that it's very hard to do... What, 84, 84 casts a huge shadow, whether it was a male cast, a female cast, a black cast, an Asian cast, doesn't matter. That movie still casts a huge shadow. Done. It just does. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, if you want to continue and make it into a sequel, which would have made a lot more sense, and these women could have been, like, relatives or something of Ghostbusters... 
I wouldn't have minded. I think people would have calmed down a little bit. But the problem was, it's always had some bad press. I mean, we've been on the internet. I don't have to re-educate what the director said, what people on YouTube were saying. But females were coming out on channels and saying, like, oh, it's a female cast, but the jokes aren't as good and they aren't as funny. Well, trailer is one thing. Movie is something else. I, I can just... So many trailers I saw, and I'm like, no. I finally sat down and watched the movie. It really wasn't that bad. The problem today is that trailers are showing too much. And I think that's the problem. Like, they're, sh they're showing scenes, not clips. And there's a difference. And I think that's why people were getting tuned out of this. But people on YouTube or any comment section are pretty much saying, if you don't like this movie, you're a whiny little bitch, or... Uh, you need to get a life, or, or I think Judge Apple told whether he was kidding or not, saying like you're a Trump supporter. One has nothing to do with the other. Again, I'm going to do my comparisons on the Hunnic Outcasts podcast in a few weeks and go back and forth with Kendra, Todd, and Edward. But I wanted to do this vlog because I had to spew this out. There's, there's, you know, and the story. It feels like something out of the Saturday morning or syndicated cartoon show, which was in bad, or even the comics. Again, people could compare that movie, but you know what? Nobody complained when the Saturday morning or the weekday syndicated show, The Real Ghostbusters, came out. Not that filmation series. I mean, people were like, eh, and I don't blame them. But when The Real Ghostbusters came out, and because of likeness issues, they had to be designed differently and voiced differently, even though Maurice Mar uh, LaMarche stated that he could only, you know, when he looked at Egon, he was told he kept doing a Harold Ramis impersonation, nobody said anything, and the rest is history. But the point being is that when that cartoon show came out, nobody complained because it lasted several seasons. And when Slimer became the Scrappy Doo, you know, it was mixed, but there wasn't flamethrowers or torches or bitching or moaning complaining. It was like, well, in an animated verse in the 80s, this is, the you know, with, with special effects being what they were back then, unfortunately, and, and budget and whatnot, we got to see the Ghostbusters continue going on some adventures. And they did more than just battle Gozer. They battled the Boogeyman, which was a great episode, Sam Hain, the Spirit of Halloween, which also is a 22-minute episode and was great. There were so many great episodes, and, and they even battled Cthulhu. So... Nobody ever complained about the series, and I have the 2009 Time Life Limited Edition Firehouse Complete Series set. I love it. You know, the comics were a mixed bag for me, but the point is they got to continue your adventures, and nobody really complained so much, but they still wanted a sequel, and we got one in 89. It was subpar. Today, it's a guilty pleasure, but... It, it was ironic that we wanted a sequel, but to tide us over, we got the cartoon show and the comics. And then when we finally got the sequel, it was a mixed bag. But I'll get to that one down the road again. You know, I'll, I'll get there one day when, when I'm ready to talk about Ghostbusters 2, because I got a lot to say about that one. Back then, I didn't care. It felt like an 80s movie, and... I didn't care about the story for Ghostbusters 2, but what it lacked in originality, it made up for and just seeing the Ghostbusters back on the screen again. Even though it kind of felt like Ghostbusters 1, they just changed a few things around, and it wasn't as solid, but again, it was adequate verge, adequate and average. But I love the cartoon. I mean, it's one or the other, so I don't mind this reboot as much. I mean, I went in there, eyes... Cr yeah, honestly, no, mm, no, I'm not going to laugh. There's a few times I did chuckle. And I think Chris Hemsworth's character is Kevin as the receptionist, that he's, like, really stupid. He doesn't know how to answer a phone. When he brings Melissa McCarthy coffee, so he gets the sugar in it, and he tastes it, and he spits it, and he gives it, he says, yeah, the sugar in it. And the way that he says it, or he just, like, he gets up and leaves because he said, I'm in a hide-and-seek competition. Chris Hemsworth 
acts like a Money Python character, and it works. Or he actually is that Steve Carell character from Anchorman, and it just, it works. It just does. So Hemsworth is also awesome in this film. Between this, Thor, they're great. Just is. As for the story, it does feel like something out of the real Ghostbusters show or the comics. Guy gets bullied a lot. He's He almost acts like Robert De Niro from Taxi Driver. Like, sometimes I just wish, you know, Flood comes and wash all the scum out of this town or something. It's been a while since I've seen Taxi Driver, but that's what it acts like. He pretty much goes around and puts bombs around the city to open up the dimension for the need the world for the ghost to come in and invade and destroy the world because he just has been bullied and been tired of being bullied and he just wants to be in charge he gets, turns into he turns himself into a ghost and he wants to rule the world so when you see the trailer and you see the ghosts there is a scene where you see like these green hands touching the window that's because he kind of sort of there's no other way to explain it. He kind of sort of built a containment unit, but his containment unit was able to bring the ghosts from the neither world into the world of the living, but then he has to set bombs to release them. So, that didn't bother me so much. And as for the ghosts looking like something out of the Haunted Mansion from the Disney World attraction, not from the movie, or both, whatever, I think that was to desensitize the kids, but again, in 84, after when little kids saw Ghostbusters and were scared of ghosts and monsters, they loved the fact that they can get proton packs, or imagine these proton packs, to take care of the ghosts. So, to make the ghosts a little bit more cartoony in this version, to desensitize kids, I don't... I mean, the whole point of it was that if the kids were scared of ghosts... They can use proton packs now and ghost traps. And there were even episodes of Ghostbusters about the Boogeyman, about standing up to the Boogeyman. Literally, the Boogeyman. Like, the Boogeyman was the Boogeyman in an episode of Ghostbusters. And these two kids were afraid of it. Even Egon admits as a kid he was scared to death of the Boogeyman. And, and, and how there was, a two, it, there was actually a follow-up episode where Egon was always afraid of the Boogeyman. And his fear was keeping the Boogeyman still in existence and how Egon had to stand up to the Boogeyman at one point, it, b besides these kids that, that were being scared of the Boogeyman, so I don't know why you have to make and the Boogeyman in the real Ghostbusters cartoon was the voice and design was like something out of nightmares, which was great so I don't know why you have to make the ghost so cartoony and so, you know not to, not to bother kids. To me, that, that makes little to no sense. Slimer has a cameo. Again, when I saw the trailer, I thought he comes out of the hot dog cart, and he looks at the Ghostbusters, and he looks like he hands up like he's going to surrender. And I thought maybe he'd be like the scrappy dude like in the real Ghostbusters series. And he's not. Uh, he's a malevolent little prick. And he just... He goes boo to the Ghostbusters, and then he sees the Ecto-1, and he steals it, and he takes it for a joyride. He just spends most of the movie just, like, driving around in the Ecto-1 with a female version of Slimer with some other ghosts, and then just going on a joyride. That's it. And I was like, Paul Feig said that Slimer's such an iconic character, and with this someone of ecto I was hoping he would be the scrappy do again. I mean, that's... I mean, I know the origins of Slimer, that he was supposed to be based on John Belushi... And then for the Royal Ghostbusters cartoon, they wanted him to be like the Scrappy Doo, and he had his own series that wasn't that great. But I was kind of hoping that we'd see him as the Scrappy Doo. But no, he just he just drive. You know, he doesn't even slime anybody. He's just like he drives the Ecto One around, which is bizarre because he's a little spud, and I don't know. Just he uses his magic to like move the pet pedals and whatnot. So, I, I was just hoping for a little bit more with him. But, I'm not going to lie, if you've seen the trailer, the one of the best scenes is actually the concert scene. It's really not terrible. They do have a hotel scene, and, it's, again, it's it's not the hotel scene, but it's, it's good. As for the mayor in this movie and his aide... The mayor is Andy Garcia, and his aide is Cicely Strong from Saturday Night Live. But Andy Garcia, 
again, if you remember when uh, James Franco and Seth Rogen's movie The Interview came out and uh, North Korea got pissed off and the Guardians of Peace hacked all the emails. Yeah, they did give this away with the mayor, that the mayor secretly is funding the Ghostbusters, but to keep up appearances, for some, he has to pretend like the Ghostbusters are frauds, and he does have Ecto-1 towed, and he has them arrested, but then the aide will come and say, well, he really thanks you, and he's really funding you, but it just... Andy Garcia just looks bloated and bored, and his line reads are terrible. There's There's one point where... Wig's character compares him to the mayor in Jaws because New York is going to be overthrown by ghosts. It's like, don't act like the mayor from Jaws. And the and guy says, don't you dare compare me to the mayor of Jaws. But the way that it, the deliveries are just horrible. There are some good line reads and there are some good deliveries, I think, from Jones and Chris Hemsworth. But from McCarthy, McKinnon, and Wig, no, they're not. The chemistry and deliveries and line reads are just not jiving for me. As for the cameos from Bill Murray, Ernie Hudson, Sigourney Weaver, Annie Potts, Dan Aykroyd, I was disappointed because Murray kind of comes off as John Hammond from Jurassic Park, the movie, and a little bit of Walter Peck, like he's this famed debunker. And I thought he would be the Walter Peck, and he's not. It's... I don't want to go in too much into it, but... There wasn't enough of him, and I thought there was more more point to the character, even though it was a cameo, but it was a waste of talent and time. Annie Potts as well. I mean, when they were on the screen, they were playing different characters. and Well, actually, Annie Potts was playing the same character that she did in 84, where she was just this... She's a hotel manager, but she's still the same Janine from 84, where she's still... You know, what do you want? What, you know, and she goes so quickly. It's amazing. People in the theater. There weren't many people in the theater for the screen. There was maybe about, myself included, five to twelve people, it felt like. It was weird. Once I put the 3D glasses on, it fit, I don't know, it was weird. It felt like there were more people. And then when I took it off and I turned around, there weren't that many. And then as soon as the movie was over, there was five. And I don't know if there were, like, shadow people, but... For all the hoopla and publicity and everything, no, not a lot of people showed up. Um, Artie Hudson was awesome. He plays Leslie Jones' uncle. He was great. There was enough, and he shows up towards the end because he's the one who gives Leslie Jones the hearse that Kate McKinnon turns into Ecto-1, which is... I Actually, I do like this Ecto-1. We don't see much of it in the inside, but for the outside goes, the hood ornament is kind of interesting, and, you know, she mentions that there's new equipment, that there's, like, a proton pack on top of the roof, well, on top of the roof, yeah, of the Ecto-1, we don't really get to see it in action, it just, it's the MacGuffin, but it was, it was adequate. Um, Stay Puff also makes a cameo, there is a scene where the Ghostbusters are battling Macy's Thanksgiving Day balloons from, I guess, 1910 or whatever. And while they're shooting the balloons, one that comes out towards the very end is Stay Puff. And so that's his cameo. And it's there is kind of sort of a Stay Puff. Um, when they're ready to battle the guy who was bullied and he turned into a ghost, he's just flying around the ghost. When he does possess Chris Hemsworth's character for a while, and then they're able to get the ghost out of his body. And then the ghost goes, okay. I'll be anything you want me to be, and Leslie Jones says, I want you to be cute and friendly, and Chris Hemsworth's character, who's, like, a little out of it, but he's talking in his sleep, when I says, I like ice cream. So, the Stay Puff in this movie is a hybrid of the no-ghost symbol mascot character and ice vanilla ice cream. But I have to admit, though, it being this kaiju-esque character with the facial expressions and walking around and battling and destroying buildings and the city and the Ghostbusters, I have to admit, as cartoony as it is, it's kind of badass. It really is. So, 
what do I think of this movie entirely? Right, um, I'm gonna go more into it in the Hunter Gowcast because I re definitely can't wait to talk about this with Kendra Todd Edward. And, but I, you know, I I I put a little blurb out on the Facebook, and I just can't wait to talk about this movie. So this is just like a small sample of what we're gonna be talking about on the podcast once I roundtable this. It's fan fiction. It's a C rating, like. One being the lowest and the hundred being the highest. It's a seventy. It's like a C average or seven out of ten or two and a half out of five. I can't wait to see it again. Surprisingly, I almost would have, you know, seen it today. I will go in a couple of days to see it again, and I probably rent it. And of course, there is a post credit scene. There, there's actually some mid credit scenes, which is interesting. But the post credit scene is that Zool may be in the sequel. Now, the problem I have with this, it's like any sequel right now, and I think Christopher Nolan's to blame. Dark Knight, we got Joker in the sequel, with the new Godzilla, King Ghidra is supposed to be in the sequel, Spider-Man 2, Green Goblin shows up in the sequel, sort of, kind of. I guess they feel like the major villain's gonna show up in the sequel, like you'll get like Scarecrow and Ra's al Ghul, but then in the sequel you'll get like the villain you wanted. As much as I like to see these Ghostbusters battle Zool, there are so many other things they could battle that I just... As much as I was harsh with McCarthy and Wig and McKinnon, I want to see them again. I definitely want to see more of Leslie Jones, because, again, she is the breakout in this, but... There is air left in the balloon, the flowers still standing. It's a guilty pleasure, and the good thing is, it wasn't the worst movie of 2016. X-Men Apocalypse, for me right now, is the worst summer movie of 2016, as far as I'm concerned. But Ghostbusters 2016, no. It's not the worst. I do hope it gets a sequel, though. I really do. I, because I, I, I would like to see... what Now now that we've seen the introduction, all the hate is, is probably dying down, and people are dousing us with mood slime, if you know what I mean, from Ghostbusters 2. I want to see what they're going to do next. I don't want to see them fight Zool. Give give me something besides... We've seen Zool. I mean, Batman fighting Joker in the Dark Knight, that was just because people wanted to see Joker again. But I remember seeing Joker in Suicide Squad in a couple weeks, but I want to see them go against something else. And I'm sure there's got to be something. And and Paul Feig is the director. Feig, 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 Feig. I don't know why there wasn't a female director. If this was going to be female Ghostbusters, wouldn't it make more sense to have a woman's touch to this or not? I, I don't know. But it, if you don't like the movie, no, you're not sexist. It's just that I understand that some people, there are reasons why we love 84. But, again, it's... I'm not being cyberbullied. If It's just my opinion. It wasn't... A terrible movie so look forward to the podcast soon once i wrangle up kendra todd and the rest and we will have the podcast in a few weeks where we'll again round table it you can follow us over on all social media which i'll put the show notes and the links and so on and so forth and talk to you all next time